All right, we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening. Hi, everyone. We are broadcasting from StreamYard today, as always, in English. And we are at LinkedIn and YouTube. If you can put in comments that you can see us and you can hear us, that would be great. Because Lisa was uh, struggling a bit with the computer. Uh, no. I'm always fully prepared, ready, five minutes early. I have to live up to my Swiss heritage. <laughs> Charm. Okay. <laughs> Finnish friend is here. Uh, good evening from Finland. Perfect. He's so far both working. He's checking it Fantastic. for us for both like uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. I'll, I'll put also You're just my, my LinkedIn on, you know, if it works. And I have to say tonight, tonight is such a great topic because we're talking about conflict and how to navigate conflict and make it work for you. And when I told my husband about this, he was like, great, let me know when you figured that out. <laughs> you have a lot of conflicts at home. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, we don't, we yeah. don't have that no. many conflicts because my wife is always right, you know. Right? So, <laughs> okay, so. Look, if my, one. if my wife is at home, I don't need Google because my wife knows everything, you know, everything. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Listen, everybody, Let, if there's nothing else you take away from today, yeah. it's that your wife is always right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so guys, let's start. Maybe I'll ask, you know, Lisa to kick it off uh, because... Uh, very often, you know, um, conflict is perceived as something very negative. And conflict can be something very truthful, you know, fruitful, uh, uh, something which can, you know, create a new movement and changes, you know, right? But I have a couple of, you know, notes, like some of the conflict I was in and I was like asked to solve, uh, but I'll, I'll ask Lisa to kick it off first. Yeah, I can't wait to hear all these juicy stories of your yeah. conflict. Um, yeah, but you, you've said it spot on. I can't tell everybody how much when I have new clients coming to me, new businesses coming, the number one thing they come for is they say, we're having conflict on the team. Can you come and fix it so we don't have conflict anymore? And of course, my answer, which is maybe surprising, I say, absolutely not. We don't want to get rid of conflict. If everybody agrees too much and there's no conflict, you have group think, you have no diversity, you will lose in the marketplace. If we need conflict. We need different ways of looking at things and thinking about things in order to move forward, make progress, be innovative, get the best ideas heard. Right. So actually, it's a warning sign if you have no conflict uh, that someone's probably repressing something that they're not safe to speak up. So the real question that people should be asking is not how do I get rid of conflict? It's how do I make conflict useful? How do I make it work for okay. our team instead of against us? Right. So um, I'm actually very interested, Jan, to hear all of your stories. But maybe maybe I'll start off with um, just a simple tip about what is the most common cause of conflict. And it's not what people think, because most people say, I'm rational, I show up to business, I put my emotions aside, and I show up with all rational brain, you know, I'm here for business and business is business. It's not the case, we can't do that. Our human brains work in a certain way and our emotions come up first, right? And so what actually happens when there's a lot of conflict is people are feeling, um, you know, some kind of uh, an expertise is being questioned of mine. Like I should be recognized as the expert and someone else is questioning what I'm saying. I better go double down on how smart and how right I am. So most of the time, the conflict is not actually about the content at all. It's not usually rational at all. It's emotional. It's in our fear-based part of our brains. And we feel we need to protect. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to look you know, like we're not the smartest, not the most up-to-date. And so we're just there to protect. So my number one tip, if you want to make conflict de-escalated, go from bad conflict to helpful and useful conflict, is to make sure that you're not making anybody feel wrong or stupid. 
So I'm going to leave that in your minds. I'll plant a few more seeds like that. But maybe, Jan, you could tell us about a time when you had conflict. Yeah. I, I also want to know when it didn't work, like when you tried to solve it and it didn't go well. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, if you if, let's look, I, I'm always, uh, you know, looking into the history. OK, so let, let's look into the history of the history of the conflicts. OK, I mean, in the past, if you know you were like there there was some you know big conflict there, there was some you know tribe say okay and there was some big conflict that the, that that party which you know lost that was probably pushed out of the group and that meant you know basically hey I, i'm dying you know right so we have deeply in us we have a fear to lose if we have a conflict we sometimes push some stupid things very often we are driven by our emotions rather than about our you know rational part of the brain so we have fear to lose this is it in each and every of every us there is a fear to lose okay so how can we find courage to do win-win agreement because those are only like if there's a win-win this is the only long-term agreement if you wanted to read more seven habits of the most effective people from Stephen Covey. He talks about it a lot, you know, right? Yeah. You can do it. It's a lot of work to create, you know, win-win agreement, but only win-win agreement is sustainable. For that, you obviously need to understand yourself. So there needs to be high self-awareness, but you need to understand the other party because each and every of you, you know, on the call, we have a different views on ourselves, on the other people and on the whole world. It's called, you know, paradigm, okay? And if there is a conflict and there is like one ego against the other ego, like one monkey against the other monkey, guess what? You know, there's no agreement and we just fight. We just fight, you know, right? So once we move to like, okay, I will use more my neocortex, my logical part of the brain, and I will do the same thing. Maybe we can find something. And, and in my view, you need to start with the, with, the, with the smallest common denominator, that there is something small we really can agree, okay? And you will start from that small, you know, piece, you will start to create, step by step, you will start to create trust, okay? Once you have that small piece where you can agree, you can figure out, hey, let's agree on what we disagree. Okay, but you still will be because you agree on something, you will start to trust each other and you will be on the logical level. Okay, and once you have it, you can, you know, like create a framework. Okay, can we work like step by step on the strategy, how we can, you know, solve it? And maybe we can bring somebody else we both trust, you know, to bring, you know, a resolution. Okay. Because the trust is based on predictability. The other party, you may have a conflict, me and Lisa, we may have a conflict, we may disagree with, with each other, but because we know each other for some time, we basically trust to each other. And we that's why we can build on, on, on that, okay? And, and th there is another piece, because emotions are contagious once, you will start to build the trust. You know, the other person or other, other people, other group, will mirror you more or less okay i give you probably the biggest conflict i was you know in the really biggest in my life and the most expensive was you know microsoft was microsoft case against european commission okay very bad pr around them it, it was like they, they they were not saying microsoft against dg you know director general uh, competition but it was saying microsoft against europe to create like media <laughs> create much more like hey you know we are enemies or whatever and microsoft lost that case and we needed to settle the case and when we started to negotiate with european commission we we didn't trust them they didn't trust us okay what was what was in that case common denominator first of all they said, hey, Jan, you are from small country. <laughs> if you would be like from Germany, France, or UK, that would not work, okay? Because they are usually, there's some history in Europe. But you are from small country. You didn't have many conflicts like Czech Republic. So <laughs> it's good, you know, and you are chairman, so it's good, you know, right? So I started to be really involved. And what we created with my team, we created basically 
kind of the common denominator with the European Commission, and that was future of Europe and future of European competitiveness, education, and so on. I, I, I basically said, let's talk win-win. We are here for long term, and you know, we will be successful in Europe only if, if Europe will be successful on the global market, okay? And now we, we, we started to create this narrative, and we start to believe each other much more. We, we were supposed to pay 11 billion fine, you know, to European Commission. We, Couple paid, of pennies. we paid a little bit, you know, more than 2 billion. And after like three years, I became trusted advisor of European Commission for higher education. That's how, you know, there was a really big conflict. That's how big conflict can, can in my view, that's how big conflict can, can really be solved, you know, right? You need to create this common denominator. And then it's about, uh, it's about chemistry. Because if me and Lisa will, disagree, will agree on some small thing, that means that, you know, we will generate some uh, serotonin and oxytocin on the trust, you know, level and work from there, you know, like on, on that, that. And it's much, much better. And then it's much harder for your monkey to do that emotion hijack. If you disagree, you will disagree, but it will be more logical. The issue is if we disagree and it's emotional, we believe we are right. And the other the other part is more or less enemy, you know, right? There's There's no way like... You know, through you cannot make good deal through your, you know, em, through the negative emotions. If you have like positive emotions, you both are happy afterwards. That's fine, you know, right? But you cannot. The, the monkey is not monkey is there to enable you to survive, but not negotiate good deal. You know, like good long term, you know, sustainable deal. So that's kind of you know from my side. Yeah, but again, that's exactly it. So most of the time people think about conflict as in we're against each other. And what you've said is exactly what everyone needs to keep in mind. It's not that we're against each other. We need to turn and work together side by side towards a common problem that we have, right? And one of the best things we can do is find things we have in common. So often you, you, we go in trying to make the other person wrong or trying to prove our point. I'm right. Let me find another rational way to show you how right I am. This is what people think. Oh, that person must not get why I'm right. So let me just yeah. give another fact about why I'm right. Please, abort does not work. <laughs> Think about what's going on for the other person. What's going on for me and what am I wanting? What's the other person going through? And then how do we turn together to solve together towards this common problem that we have? I would also, I mean, I see tons of conflicts, very simple case. Um, someone comes in and asks their boss for a raise. I'm coaching the boss and the boss is going, I'm not giving this person a raise. How do I have a nice conversation? I don't wanna lose the person but we're in a little bit of a conflict. And I said, okay, what do you have in common? So perfect, John, just what you said. What do you have in common? Well, she thinks this is fair and I think this is fair. And I said, great, you both want fairness. You both have a common goal of finding a fair resolution. Start talking about what you have in common, talk about fairness, talk about how you define fairness, talk about creative solutions so that both parties walk away feeling that was fair does not mean she got the pay raise, but it does mean she walked away because they talked about how they could architect her work to maybe get towards the pay raise and how she could maybe have some time off or get a new interesting project, right? And then all of that felt fair because that's what they were both actually seeking. So this is another challenge that what most people do is they're fighting about something, but what they don't realize is that to solve it, you don't actually want to talk about the conflict that's presenting. You want to talk about it in a bigger picture. Exactly. So, and that's really hard to do. That's really hard to like zoom out and say, but what are we really talking about here? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm working with some founders who are saying, yeah, well, they have the CEO has a little bit more shares than I do. And but I feel like I'm doing more of the work. So I'm not really sure if the compensation is set up properly, but I'm really resentful every time I go into a meeting and I see that he's not working as hard as I am. That's a conflict. Right. So how do we work through what's the right amount of work? How would you feel recognized? Maybe it's not shares. We're not really talking about shares. We're talking about how do you get recognized or how do we ask the other person to do more work? 
So again, whatever you think is the presenting problem is often not, it's just a distraction and you need to go deeper and think what's really going on here. And yeah, solve it that core exactly. Very often we are like stuck. It's kind of the fixed, yes. you know, mindset. We are stuck with the problem. In, 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 imagine there are two parties and we work together, say 10 years already. We are working together and more or less it was good. And suddenly we have a really some big, big issue. There's a one monkey against the other monkey in the other brain. Right? So how can you solve it? What Lisa said, kind of, the, you know, from the negative zoom in to the positive zoom out. Zoom out. Take a paper and put in the center of that paper the conflict, whatever is the conflict. It can be the shares, okay? And around that, put everything which we built together. We were working a lot of, you know, together on the different projects and whatever, you know, different, we brought different products to the market, whatever. And you will see, and suddenly your brain will, what do you need to do in those conflicts? You need to start like logic against the logic. You need to move from one monkey to the logic and the other monkey to the logic. And this piece of the paper can help you because you will realize, okay, there's so many things we did together. So there's a small piece which we need to solve. Let's look what we did in the past and let's, let's you know, work from there. Let, let's, you know, work from the, from the trust and how we can, you know, solve it. And as you, as you rightly said, maybe it's not the number of the shares. It's maybe recognition, you know, right? Because everybody, if you take the Maslow pyramid of, of, the, of the needs, it's basically, you know, uh, recognition and self-recognition. And on, on, the, on the top, it's like, uh, you know, uh, the, the self-actualization that you, you have really, your job is, you know, your, your meaning, right? Yes. So uh, the, the other interesting thing, what Lisa said about conflict. So if there are like two people in the same room and they agree with each other all the time, Probably one of them is redundant, maybe both of them, okay? Because <laughs> honestly, I mean, it's like, it's about diversity, okay? And diversity as such is great because you can, you, you, if everybody would think like, okay, and it, th there's a one thing which, which I did when I was like 30, 35 years old, I have a tendency to hire people with a similar mindset like me, okay? That would be like extroverts with good strategy, whatever, you know, like ENTJ in, in Myers-Briggs. Myers ENT. ENTJs, they have a lot of good things, but they have a couple of, you know, caveats. Number one, ENTJs, they think they are always right. That's number one, okay. <laughs> number two, ENTJs are hiring usually ENTJs. For those of you who don't know what is Myers-Briggs, it's like taxonomy, whether you are an extrovert or introvert, how you work with the information and stuff like that. It's basically tests, like the personality. Personality you know. assessment, And yeah. once I realized, hey, it's in fact good to have people with a different opinion. They'll challenge you. They, they give you different, you know, feedback, right? Uh, so it, it is good because, and one thing is like, you know, diversity in your group or in your team. And the other element is it's the first step to have a diverse group. And then the second step is how you include like different opinions together. So there is a synergy, which means that one plus one is more than two. You know, you know what I mean, what I mean right? Exactly. There is a, there is a, there is a simply, you know, synergy. And I think it takes a, a lot of leadership, you know, right? And like conflict resolution to me, it's not like, hey, okay, I will, you know, increase your salary, your salary, and you will, you know, you will be fine. No. Conflict resolution is really like win-win, and it's even a win for the company or for the team, you know, right? To move you on the on the next level. That that's that's kind of what I think about the conflict. Yeah. So, uh, Jan, as you were saying, when we're sitting in meetings and we're we're you know the monkey part of your brain, I love that you call it that. The monkey part of your brain is saying no, defend why that person shouldn't be adding something, why that person doesn't understand the exact thing. And then all I'm going to say is everybody just take a breath and ask yourself, this is how we're going to work with your brain. But basically, Jan and I are going to hack your brains. We're going to tell you how to work with the neuroscience of your brain. So you're here. You want to breathe that out. Flip yourself to here, which is where you can connect with other people, where you can be curious, where you can be expansive and innovative. And you're going to say, what? could be 10% true about what that person just said. Exactly. Step so by that, step. Yeah. Exactly. You don't 90% of it is probably garbage. 
Okay, yep. throw it out the window. <laughs> but what can be 10% true? And I want, I sometimes have my coaches just memorize a sentence where the first time you open your mouth, you say, what I like about that is, and you find something interesting, something you like about it, something that's true. And from there, that's where you're finding that level of agreement or that level of connection that it doesn't feel like a no versus a no. It feels like a yes and, right? So the, the example I always give, it sticks in my head. Someone once said, the sky is purple. Well, all of us on the call today know the sky is not purple. So you would say, no, the sky is blue if you want to be in a conflict. If you want to use the, the diversity of what the person just said, you think, what's 10% true about that? Oh, that's interesting. The sky does change colors throughout the day. Sunrise, sunset, right? It's Clouds. Clear. So you can say, oh, wow, um, you're right. The sky can shift in colors. Yeah, that reminds me of, for this product, we could have something shifting, right? So you find, even if it's so, so wrong, you can always find some truth and find a way to say yes and agree with that and then uh, expand it along. Because if you hear a yes and someone is going, yes, I see what you mean. Yes, that's cool. Yes, that makes sense. I say to my daughters, my daughters say, can we have dessert, mom? Can we have dessert, mom? I say, yes, tomorrow we're going to have those cookies. Instead of saying no, I've said yes, but for tomorrow. And that's how we can negotiate yeah. a little bit of conflict and turn it into a positive experience so we don't go back into our monkeys fighting against each other mode. So yes, and, uh, Yeah, and it, it takes a bit time. For example, if you are at a meeting, it's always good to build first some bonds, maybe have a, some small talk or some, you know, game or whatever. What do you need to do, basically? You And if you really try to get what is best in the group, you want to create the team flow, okay? So that you, not only you are in the flow, for a moment when it's very tough, you, you you try to solve tough problem, you know, right? But you are at your best. You use your best talent. This is the flow, okay? But it takes some time to get you in the flow because you need to shut down basically amygdala, the, the monkey, and it's called, you know, a high uh, uh, upper uh, front uh, cortex. Like you need to make sure that you everything else is shut down and you're like, you know, front cortex is working, you know, right in the in the flow. And it takes some time. It's like give you one example. Those of you who are runners, it's usually like kind of the tough experience first five, 10 minutes. But after 15 yeah. minutes, it's kind of the neutral. And then after 20 minutes, you are in, in, in uh, it's called runner's high, but a runner's high equals, you know, flow basically, right? Yeah. So you are there and then you run and you run like you do enjoy it. And that's the same with the, with the mental activity, okay? So if you, if you try to solve something, there's a conflict or whatever, you know, right? You, you need to go really like step by step. If you go immediately, you jump on it. I mean, it, it is quite natural that your amygdala tries to protect you, right? Saying, okay, because what is what is happening on your, you know, background, on the uh, on, on your subconscious? It's like, okay, if I will not talk now and if I will not, you know, push back, then maybe I will not be promoted. Whatever. Remember, amygdala is protecting your life basically it's not about the life anymore you know right but this is what evolution brought to us you know Thank right you. The, 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 this is this is why so it, it's another piece like go you know step by step and it's even like if if you have a conflict with your friends it's you know very normal to have a you know conflict and disagree with each other right the only the only part of the lie where I don't see huge progress and where it's very hard, you know, now to solve conflicts is politics. <sighs> but, you know, politics is like we call like okay. Let's imagine. Let's play the the model. Okay, Lisa, I will be like left wing party. Alisa will be right wing party. Okay, we are called opposition, which means that by definition we should not agree with each other. Come on, you know we. Are, our views are opposed. If we would disagree, we would not be, you know, very uh, attractive for the media. We need to disagree by definition, you know, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And that's why 
you have not that much progress anymore in politics. And you know, demo, uh, to me, democracy is the best system, but we need to figure out how we can move faster in democracy. Because sometimes we're spending so much in time in the circles, you know, not, not being able to create uh, some uh, reasonable solution, right? Well, and that's the thing. I love this with polarization. I mean, obviously, we've all experienced yeah. it. Politics, COVID, you know, tennis scandals, you name it. We see polarization happening everywhere. And really what's happening is we're feeling so much uncertainty that we're trying to cling to something certain. It's the same thing that happens when we're in conflict. We need to hold on to something. We need to hold on to being right or smart or the things we knew from five years ago, they must still be true because if they're not. Uh... And so we really hold on to protect. And I think the biggest thing that we could do, polarization, politics, conflict in the workplace is to let go of having to protect. Right. And I, we have a great uh, note here that says, yeah, but it takes a little bit of time. Here's a very easy trick. When you notice that you're triggered and you will feel it because you will sit up more, your heart will beat faster, your hands will go up, your palms are sweating. Physiologically, it'll change. Take a drink of water. Give yourself a pause. Yeah. Do this. Absolutely. <laughs> that gives your brain enough time to go. Don't always feel you have to respond just because someone else is speaking at you. You set the pace, take a pause, give them a second. Don't be afraid of silence. So that's interesting what you're saying. Let me take a second to think about that, right? You can have these phrases in your pocket ready because you're ready to, instead of escalating the conflict, yeah. you can be ready to figure out how that is a whatever is your situation okay it's 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 the freedom of your choice whether you will react immediately and that's your monkey okay or you will breathe in breathe out or whatever you may say hey let me think about that and you will basically enlarge the gap between the stimuli and your reaction that's the way how you can move from the emotional reaction to the logical and more, you know, rational reaction, right? Yeah. I mean, emotions, I mean, it, it's quite normal to have, you know, some reactions, but some, you know, emotions are not necessarily good for us. And maybe you may, you may, you know, say something and you, then you will be like, oh, I'm sorry, I should not say it, whatever, you know, right? So w once you will have your, you know, amygdala, your monkey more uh, under the control, it, it will be better even like how you will solve the, the conflict and how you work with the other with the other people because you may you you don't look if you want to learn something new it's usually you know from the people with different or you know diverse opinions yeah. right because you, you if you want to learn something new it's like hey i need to challenge status quo okay for example when i started to learn neurobiology and you know uh epigenetics, I learned in the school that the genes are genes and you cannot do anything around it. And that's what I thought still like 10 years ago, because I was not the epigenetic, you know, student, whatever. But then I started to really learn from the from the different, you know, people with different opinion. And then you change. It's like paradigm shift in your brain saying, hey, I'm responsible for 90 percent of my genes. OK, I got it, you know, but what will happen with those genes? I'm on the point, you know, right? I'm on the point and I'm responsible because the way I think, where I, you know, live, you know, what I say, every every word will create new thought. Thought is creating, uh, you know, emotion. What is emotion? Energy in motion, you know, and yeah. from Emovere. And emotion will appear immediately on your, you know, body, right? So it has to do, which means that each and every word you may say, is influencing your genes, your, you know, health, your life, right? Yes. I mean, the other thing, Jan, that we haven't even talked about yet is how to know when it's worth engaging in conflict. How do you know when it's worth speaking out? That's interesting. Out? Oh, that's in hey, that's that's interesting, you know. Right? Uh, so, because, uh, uh, yeah. Right? Go ahead, tell me. 
Okay, I I must say that very rarely people would criticize me because of the of my you know content, what I'm sharing with them, what I'm talking about. Very rarely. Okay, sometimes that's the truth, but it's small things. But usually it's like my appearance that I talk too much by my hands, whatever, right? And and like to me, like it's it. a small thing, and for me, it makes no sense, you know, to like push back or whatever. Okay. And the other thing is, sometimes I'm getting like, hey, Jan, what can you tell us where, where this data is coming from? So I'm bringing some study, then another study. But I still, there was some, you know, gentleman recently, and he wanted to e explain what, me, what it means out of the comfort zone and out of the comfort zone. I said, you should, you know, read a book about flow or, you know, Stephen Kotler. Uh, the art of impossible explaining what is exactly the flow because flow is when you are out of the comfort zone it's clear right? but he was still like pushing back then he said then he was like saying hey you are demagogical or whatever and i said well that makes no sense for me to yeah. you know continue this discussion right so you at some point you know look for me i tell you what is helping at least to me yeah. i'm like i want to work with the people who want to work with me and I, I'm absolutely fine if it's only 90% of the population on this planet. <laughs> it doesn't need to be 100%, okay? That's <laughs> or good. maybe, we can I, reach I don't know. You know what I mean, right? And I, I thought 90 was a good goal, yeah. I mean. Life is short, so you should not spend it. If it's, like, if it's productive conflict, you know, fine. Okay, let's, let's, sorry, let's talk about it. But if it's unproductive, and then people like, look, I... If you will go, uh, I, I'm never like openly criticizing anybody on, you know, social networks. That's my kind of the number one. If I criticize something, I go always and I message that person. If I criticize, I criticize the activity, not the person. At least like, you know, I, I'm mindful. My, maybe it happens sometimes, but that's the key. Okay. But if somebody is like not criticizing the content and goes like, you really look stupid because you are using too much of your hands. Fine, don't look at me. Why are you, <laughs> why are you bother? And why you spend time on YouTube watching? Yeah, it makes no sense to me, you know, right? That's fine. If you wanted to stay, say like, stay like that, that's fine. Yeah, I'm just, just put some you, handcuffs on. It's giving, me, it, it's giving me energy. I was trained by the gentleman from BBC like almost 30 years ago. And he said, yeah, it's crazy what you do. You need to stay like that. Really, like there was a moderator from the BBC. And I said, I agree everything with you, but my hand. Yeah. You know, there's no, no way for arms. You, you need know. to be you. But this is exactly, exactly the point. Exactly, yeah. You, so we have to... Go ahead. <laughs> that's in general on, on kind of the, what kind of the conflicts, you know, you should you should like engage and and what kind of conflict you should not engage right and then obviously the, the, the other thing is where you can also uh, act as a mediator to bring like there is a conflict in the group and you can be that common denominator bring you know people together okay what i usually do i'm like okay there should be like there should be like john and uh, and uh, say uh, eric okay i'm like okay john and eric Let's talk about our, you know, common experience when we were drinking somewhere, whatever, right? Having a good time at Microsoft Party or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you go and step by step, again, you know, amygdala goes down, you know, logic goes up. And they start to talk and say, hey, this is stupid, right? I mean, I think it's harder, like, you know, if the women are fighting, it's really tough. I, I'm, I was never engaged in that. You may tell me. But... Even if, the, if 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 men are fighting, men they can fight, they like physically fight, and in five minutes it's fine, you know. Okay, hey, it's you know gone because you know men are really like hunters, you know, right? And for us, even if there's a little bit of blood, doesn't matter. You know? Well, I think there's a new era coming where everyone is more in touch with their what they're feeling. And so men as well, I think a lot of it was just that men were told you're not allowed to have your emotions showing. I don't know that that actually means they didn't have emotions. So we, we have a big uh, Lisa, conversation. I never, Lisa, did you really mention COVID? Do you want to bring this up, Jan? We can address okay, it. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, okay. sure, I will. 
I I didn't realize that Lisa talked about you know COVID, but maybe you you may remember. It's a that. very sensitive theme, and how did you pass through emotional things according to the disease? Trying to stay between rational okay, and an, fears. A question. Okay. Oh, this is a great question though, and it is a part of the theme because actually what we haven't discussed, we have so many things we could talk about with conflict, is internal conflict. Conflict is not always with someone else. You also have it face internal conflicts. And so you're noticing, oh my gosh, okay, COVID, I have all these uh, feelings about what's going on and I'm trying to stay rational and I'm trying not to stay stressed. And here's the big thing. It actually ties exactly to what Jan was just saying. Oh, you know, men are tough. And I'm saying, mm. hold on. Many of us learned the appropriate way to deal with emotions is to block them, to use mental strength. And I put them aside. And actually, sometimes we need to lean into them and have a bit of curiosity. What's really going on with the fear? What's really going on with the conflict? Okay. I, coached, I coached a woman today. True story. She's going, OK, do I go for the next big promotion? I'm, do I go for this other job? What should I do? And by the end of the conversation, I when we when I said get back in touch with what who you really are and what you really want, by the end of the conversation, it was like, I don't want either of these jobs. I don't even want a corporate job at all. Right? <laughs> it's like holy macaroni. But because she had always ignored emotions, went for what made sense, what was the next progression, what was logical, and ignoring our emotions means maybe you can tell yourself that you're okay here, but the rest of your body knows that you're not really okay. And that's why you're still feeling fear. You haven't quite dealt with it. I, I don't, I can't remember if I shared publicly, but I'm happy to share my sort of journey with COVID. I was super scared to get COVID, not because I thought I would get sick with COVID, but I was very worried about long COVID. So I was very worried I would somehow get COVID and be very tired for like six months or a year. I heard it was happening to healthy young women. And I was, and I wouldn't face it. I just was kind of scared all the time. And finally, at some point I had to face this and I had to have conversations with my husband about what, you know, would, would we start going out to restaurants and things like that? And I actually finally faced the fear, went in, said, why am I worried about long COVID? And it turns out totally, I wouldn't have thought about it, but when I moved to Switzerland, it was very difficult for me and I had some trouble and I noticed that I was quite lethargic. I didn't go out as much. I didn't see people. And it was a very like um, traumatizing to the body. Like I, I had a very hard time adjusting. And so in my body, my body was telling me, if you um, have long COVID, it's going to be like that other time. And that other time was terrible. So actually, my fear was just repeating how hard it was when I moved to Switzerland. And once I realized that, because I w went with curiosity, what's my emotion, what's really going on with the fear, I was like, oh, hey, actually, that wasn't so bad. Obviously, I came out the other side and I'm fine. And then after that, I had no more fear of COVID. But that was my journey because instead of being mentally tough and saying, I don't care, and instead of just like crying in a corner at home, I wanted to go in with curiosity. And this is how you can also resolve internal conflict. Don't run from it. Don't try to rationalize. Don't just make a pro and con list. Really go in and notice where am I stuck? Where am I feeling um, like I'm not? Where, where's the uncertainty coming from? And use that to explore and find the wisdom in there. No, so absolutely. I hope that's because, yeah, your body is giving you signals. Uh, absolutely. For me, you know, COVID was because I was really like, I was in the, you know, that wallet when I got this depression 10 years ago, it was really bad. So, and it was much, much worse. It's similar like you, but it was much, much worse experience. I was that close to, to die, basically, right? So when, when COVID came, I said, okay, I have a lot of respect from for COVID, a lot of respect because we didn't know what was it and so on. But I should not be fearful because that fear would lower my immunity, right? Yes. Because if that fear is for a long time, you know, like if you have a fear and then it's like, you know, anxiety and then it's, uh, you know, the uh, stress, there's a lot of cortisol generated, you know, in your brain. It's not good for your body. So 
what I started to do, I started to do like, you know, uh, Wim Hof method, which is like cold water and special breathing. I'm still like, you know, doing a lot of exercise. And then, you know, I was like, because I, I knew how to work with your brain, what kind of the chemical cocktail is good for your body, how to improve immunity, which is like endorphin, which means let's do something you like. And I started, it was like two years ago, actually. I started to do those, you know, live sessions now. And at that time, That's I got great. probably like all together, say, say, well, 40, maybe 50,000 people. Now I have like 153 times, you know, more like on those social networks. So, so I, I started to do really like the things which I like. Then, and then because our brain likes predictability. So I like every day, I got some plan what I need to do, even though it was only online, okay? Then I was online in touch with the other people. So it's about serotonin, dopamine, it's about this, you know, plan. So it's helping you like, hey, you, you feel good. I'm And I must say, last year, like COVID-2, I was a little bit, you know, tired. It's like all of those, you know, measures. But COVID-1, actually, I, I was like, this, this is fine, right? And then obviously, look, I'm like, a lot of people are asking me, are you like, vaccinator or anti-vaccinator oh, no. i'm like no i'm young you know right so <laughs> I, asked, I asked the guy who is one of the best immunologists in my country professor Beran, and i asked him what are cons and you know uh, what are pros and cons with the vaccine and i got like three vaccines with booster and so on that was my decision but i'm not pushing anybody else it's really a, like your you know decision to do it so, and, and and this is the way I think, you know, you can like move. That's what Stoics said. Stoics, they were very smart in old Greece. They were saying, you should do only things you can influence. I cannot influence whether there will be, you know, another COVID or what will, you know, happen around me. I can influence only my behavior in the changing environment. That's exactly what I do. And that's why I'm like, yeah, if, if I will have a COVID, probably I've got COVID already, but it was like mild. And if I have it, you know, uh, hopefully because I did everything what could what I could do, right? Uh, but yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's interesting. So there, there is a from uh, Mikhail, uh, Lisa, do you know what we say in Czech Republic about physical fighting between men? One punch is like Raphael more than... <laughs> 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 so one punch solves everything. Okay, I'm no, gonna I'll yeah, work no, on that. I don't think I don't think that the Czechs in Scotland, you know, if you would be in Scotland, they uh, fighting uh, a lot, you know, right? But Czechs are not fighting that much. And I and Lisa, by the way, I didn't say that men are stronger than the women. No way. I never think, have you seen these guys? It's the other way around. <laughs> I, I'm saying that men are like if they are physically fighting, there is a peace sooner. As opposed, if you know, women are physically. <laughs> yeah, there are there are culturally different ways that people think is what's appropriate to resolve exactly. conflict, right? And it yeah. feels less appropriate for women to do that. But for men, if you've been sort of culturally trained that you can do that and then it's all good and it's done, then that is one tool in the toolkit. Now, I think that that's sort of. Um, going less and less as we get more into um you know more gender equality stuff um but if it works for you i mean if you and the other person both agree a, you know a duel and or a physical fight of some sort works no. for you I mean, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, but, just but I, I do think yeah and that you're raising a really interesting point uh, from a couple of things that yeah. you've said that to sort of tie them together right. because we talked about when is it worth picking a fight when is it worth going into conflict and for these social things, when can I actually make a difference or not, right? But I've loved watching, uh, so I'm American originally, I've loved watching Black Lives Matter, for example, where people finally said enough is enough, we're going to stand up and we're really going to make change happen, right? And so they channeled their anger or they channeled their feeling of I'm one person, I can't do anything, but we can start organizing. We can use our anger to create something good. This conflict is worth having because it will save lives, because it will you know, help society become more equal. So we, sometimes, even if it feels like a conflict that feels very heavy or fighting, yeah. it's worth it because it's aligned with our values of trying to make the world a better place. 
And this is something we haven't yet talked about for when it's worth conflict. And I say, mm -hmm. when it's really aligned with your values and you need to stand up for them, for yourself or for others, um, and also to stay really focused on what's your goal. I don't know about you, Jan. I, I, I often facilitate like leadership team meetings. I'll listen to them and they'll go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because everybody wants to have their opinion heard. And I'm like, does anybody even know what we're talking about or why we're talking about this? Because the goal was this. And then one person exactly. just said what came into their mind. Another person just said it. And nobody was focused on the goal on whether or not what they said was relevant to the goal or not. <laughs> So I, I just want to have some noticings for people. Pick and choose conflict when it's worth it, when, it, when yeah. it's important to you, when it's your values, when you're doing good. And like, let the rest kind of go, right? Don't sweat yeah. the small stuff. <laughs> I, I agree. And, and definitely, I, I think life, it's about picking up the right battles, you know, right? There's like in the sport, I have so many, you know, athletes now, some of them are, you know, uh, like, competing at the Olympic Games in, in yes. China. That's the same. Not all, like, you know, tournaments or not all, you know, matches are equal, you know, right? Because it's like, you know, Rafael Nadal, he was, like, playing some exhibition matches, whatever. Like, four months ago, he was, like, with, you know, supported, you know, material. You exactly. Know? <laughs> and now he beaten the guy who is, like, 15 years, you know, or no, not 15, but 10 years younger than him. And it was like lost battle, but it's really about mindset, you know, right? It's about what I'm saying, that the champion feels like a winner, even though he's momentarily losing. It did, because score, he was like losing 2-0, 3-2-2, and 0-40 was like Medvedev, you know, right? It was like, I mean, those people who are like, you know, guessing what will be, you know, the, the final result are like 96% for Medvedev, 4% for Rafa. And he still won. So because your score, whatever happened in the past, it's like on the score, on the, your life score or your game score or whatever. Yes. But then the future, you can influence one present moment uh, after the other. And it's, a, it's, it's about your mental score, whether you believe that you can change your life, whether it's like short life, which is the, the game of the tennis, you know, like one match, you know, or, or, or you know, yeah. uh, uh, long life, life. And I think this is, this is what it takes that you need to really figure out what is important in the life and what is not. And I and there is another, you know, in, in that book, Seven Habits of the Most Effective People, Stephen Covey is saying that we should not do the things which are not, you know, important at all. What whatever is not important, put it away. Okay. And then the battle is in two quadrants, you know, things which are urgent and important, and which are important and non-urgent. Everybody would say, oh, we should definitely do like urgent important. No. You sometimes you you cannot avoid urgent and important, but if you do urgent and important, then you are not fully using your brain, your capacity, because you are usually under the pressure. If you do yeah. things which are not urgent but are important, you can use much more your brain because you can get ready, you can be more, you know, logical. You know, if if it's urgent. Then your amygdala is like, I, I need to manage, I need to manage my time, you know, whatever, right? So, okay. so, and that's how you should, uh, you know, decide on your time. It's about like uh, prioritizing. The, the, the problem is that there's a lot of people who are like having their to do list, and all of those, you know, goals are like the same thing, okay? And they don't think like, hey, this, if I will do that, are like interdependencies, you know, right? If I will do that, that will help that, and that will help that, you know what I mean, right? And unfortunately, the, the issue is to me that the critical thinking is not taught even at the best schools, you know, right? Mm -hmm. We are not taught how to, you know, think critically and how to plan our time, you know, a, a bit, you know, we, we do. But mainly how you connect like your heart with your time, because you may, you, you may do a lot of planning, but if those activities are like, activities you don't like you know so yeah so it's a waste of life and we only have one exactly
So here's my big question for any of you who are here live. Yeah. Are you facing a specific conflict? Do you want some advice? Do you want right. us to share anything? Do you have any specific questions? Because I know, Jan and I both know, this is like the number one thing that people say, whether they're frustrated with their spouse or partner, whether they're frustrated with their kids, whether they're frustrated at work, whether they're frustrated with you know, colleagues or the board or the employees that report into them. It's so often about conflict <laughs> and how to resolve it or how to work with it. So we are super happy to answer any questions that you have. Exactly. And um, one thing that we haven't maybe talked enough about is empathy. Because when you're in conflict, here's another thing that I hear all the time. Well, I understand what the person is thinking, but they should just think this instead, or they should just do this. Like if I were them, I would do that. So they should just do that too. Empathy is not, I think about their situation and then I use my brain and put it in their body. <laughs> Empathy is I put aside what I would think or what I would feel or what I would do. And I try to understand what's going on for them. Empathy does not mean you agree. You do not need to agree, but you do need to understand. Yeah, from, yeah, exactly. You need to understand to be understood. You know, right? That's another. That's another. You know, law from the from the from the book from uh, uh, yes. Seven Habits. Seven uh, habits. Michal, Michal is asking interesting question. Michal Konstatsky uh, is from Switzerland, by the way. Is yeah. Czech origin? Yeah. Uh, and he, he's, he's, a, he's a great scientist and he's like, you know, senior leader there. But uh, what to do with toxic people? So. <laughs> so first of all, actually, Jan kind of said this quite nicely earlier. As much as possible, I look at life like a flower garden and you need to prune away some things to make sure that the beautiful stuff can really grow and thrive yeah. so in your personal life friends distant relatives try to spend as little time with them as possible you don't need to catch their emotions of negativity and harshness so that's first is try to prune away what you can if you can't because it's a work colleague or a boss mm -hmm. What you need to be able to do, at least from my perspective, is take on whatever it is they're saying, find a 10% truth. Like, don't fight that they are toxic. Accept it. I know that this person is toxic. Take on, is there anything I can learn here from this conversation? No? Throw it out the window. Great. Handled. So we don't let the emotions come in. We don't avoid them. We don't ignore them. We just don't let them burn our energy. We listen. Is there something that's helpful for me in my personal goals of learning and development and career and getting a project yeah. done? Anything here for me? No? Great. And that's how I would deal with them. Take away their power to affect you. Yeah. And, and guys, you should understand, as Lisa rightly said, that emotions are contagious both positive emotions but also negative emotions okay so you may michael you may you know take uh you know one or two people who are on the other hand like good you know team players and they have a good you know ideas and they have a usually in each and every team there is like 10 15 maybe 20 percent of people and they have disproportional higher influence on the other they are like you know influencers opinion makers in the group if you will and you need, as a leader, you need to have those people on your side, okay? If they are, like, positive. So they can really neutralize this, you know, toxic people and talk directly um, to me, you know. I was always talking to those people. And success rate was, like, 50-50, to, to, to be honest, right? Some, some real, I said, look, if you behave like that, this is the way I feel. And this is the way other people are, like, feeling. It's really like an infection in the group, okay? And some people realize and try, you know, to change. Some people did not, you know. And then we said, hey, you know, this makes no sense. There is a there is another issue, guys. If you have somebody who is a really great performer and you need that person and he's toxic, that's a tough decision, okay? And I'm always like, you need to wait, like, okay, he's a great person, but maybe I can have, like, 20% less of performance, 
but much more like positivity. You need, you need to really think about it. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, we cannot fire him because he does not behave in the right way, but he's so great. Okay. Guys, everybody can be replaced. Okay. I mean, Djokovic, Nadal, Federer are great, but at some point they will be replaced by <laughs> It's not yet. It's not yet. Let's put it in this way. It's not yet. But yeah. I'm working with my player, with Yiri. I'm, I'm working on that. You know, like, Soon. Also, we have enough time. Oh, anyway, yeah. so but, this, this is it. Yeah. yeah and you have, there's actually a book about this. Uh, for anybody who wants to know, it's a Stanford professor. He wrote the no assholes rule. No, and yeah. basically, he says, you should fire anybody who's a real asshole in your organization because of how toxic they are. So if you have that capability really strongly put a line in the sand stand up for what you say and there's a red line we don't accept behavior like this okay here we go maria indrova do you have experience with different typology of people reaction to the conflicts what is your good hint to react on aggression and manipulation during the exchange of the opinions yeah Ma maria in general every human being is different because there are no, unless they will start to clone people like a ships, you know, right? <laughs> uh, hopefully not. You are unique. Lisa is unique. Everybody is unique, right? Okay, that's why you don't have two people with totally, you know, same opinion or totally the same paradigm of, uh, you know, other people or the, the world. So it's good, you know, to understand other people. Now, what I realize, unless you understand who you are, you will not understand other person. I tell you why. Because for that, to understand other person, you need to have some comparison. You need to figure out, hey, maybe, you know, me and Lisa, we are similar. We are crazy. That's clear. Right? <laughs> yes, we are. But then there is like, Lisa, she likes to write. I hate to write. Okay, no. We, 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 there's another commonality. We like to talk. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> But, but but really build from that and then you can say okay so th this is the same this is different and this is the way how you should you know work right uh you know aggressions and manipulations it's usually you know the ego of the other person because ego guys you should understand ego is not you or the other person you know ego is the fear basically okay it's like you know it, it's a couple of fears right because we yeah th this is it and once they the other person will start to feel secure will be like in the present moment the fear is gone okay some people they got a huge ego is ego is really the fear and, and a lot of people because they, they, they think like, okay i need to buy you know big car i need to buy you know whatever big house and so on and very often it's ego because those people, it's called status symbols, you know, in marketing. And those people, they want to be recognized. OK. And then they are like shocked. If I'm in the if I'm using subway, some people are shocked. Like, Jan, how can you, you know, go by subway? I, I'm like, because it's the fastest way. And I really value my time. I'm like 60 years old. I don't want to, you know, wait on that fucking, uh, you know, bridge, you know, right? So <laughs> Subway is like, you know, so th this is it. That. Th this is it to really understand the other person. You should, uh, there are people who, you know, wants to manipulate you and we are, we are equipped that if you, if you want to understand uh, how the trust is built, it, it's about, you know, authenticity and you can marry, you can figure out you are equipped because we have neurons in our brain. But we have also neurons in our, you know, uh, digestion system. It's called gut. It's called gut feeling. Your gut feeling in 17 milliseconds, you can figure out whether that person is authentic or not. It's called incongruence. If it's incongruent with what he or she is saying, then it's like, hey, it's probably manipulation and it's not, you know, true. And then it's like predictability. If that person is saying, hey, it's like that. And then the second day, it's absolutely different. That's another hey, trust is, you know, gone. Aggression, it does the same, you know, thing. So it's good. I think it is a good to study people. But first, you need to study yourself also. You know, so right? true. And I'll just add one tip there for Maria, if you don't mind. 
Um, Maria, just for how to talk about aggression or manipulation, I go into almost like a sportscaster mode. So uh, I'll start to just articulate what's happening, what's going on, um, what they're saying. So if you if you hear they're getting really aggressive, okay, it sounds like this point is really important for you, right? So you stay calm. You just articulate. Sounds like it's really important for you. Let's um, let me go. Let me help me to understand it a little bit more because I hear it's so important for you. So aggression, manipulation, that's all coming out of this part of the brain, the monkey part of the brain. You want to help them that part of the brain. So you have to stay super neutral, right? If you can't rise up because you won't get what you want out of that, you stay focused on your goal. So your goal in that moment is they're in monkey brain. How can I bring them back to the connection part of the brain? Sounds like it's really important to you. That means it's going to be really important to me too. So let's let, let's open that one up again. Or if they're trying to manipulate, oh, that, you know, that's not exactly how I understood it to be. Let's make sure we're both on the same page because I understood that it was this. And I'm hearing you, am I hearing you correctly that you're saying it's this? So you can call it out without saying you're lying, you're manipulating, you're, but go into sportscaster mode where you're just naming what's going on, what you're seeing out of them and try to cool them down to get them reconnected with you, not to feel threatened in any way. Last question from Michal. Very interesting one. Why mediocre people succeeded sometimes more in the corporate, corporate hierarchy than those uh, different ones? Are some bosses afraid of competition in their own department? So, <laughs> Michal, very, I'll give you an answer. Bill Gates, when I was traveling with him, once I asked him, what does it take to have a best organization, best team in the world? And he said, you need to have A players, okay? <laughs> Because A players are hiring A players, B players are hiring, are creating C organization. I, I, I said, okay, I understand the first part, A hiring A, but I don't understand how B can create C organization. He said, B are not afraid only B players. Uh, they are not afraid only A players, but they are also afraid of the B players. That's why they are, uh, you know, hiring C players. Once the A players will see, okay, B is new standard, their performance goes down and it goes like that. And I, and I really believe you cannot have everybody. You can have like somebody, you can hire somebody with A potential. Maybe he's like, you know, B because he's young or whatever, you know, right? But if somebody is B for 15 years, there's no way. And maybe it, it takes, you know, different job in different company. And that it can be in the blossom, you know, right? It's maybe like that. But but this is it. And 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 really, I was working in the organization where you know majority of the players were A players. I believe that. And you know, I and and I remember once I hired some B player. And it cost me a lot of, you know, money on my bonus. And that's an, <laughs> a, a, that's absolutely right decision from my former boss, who is now uh, my Jean-Claude <laughs> is my good friend, and who is uh, now Microsoft president. This is it. What uh, you know, right? If if you want to build great organization, uh, 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 this is it. But it can, Michal, it can happen that really, like mediocrity is uh, promoted in some organization. If they are afraid, hey, this is, I rather be, you know, surrounded by some people who are like mediocre, uh, you know, so I can like, they can see, oh, he is a, a great, but it's not, you know, it's, I think it's a very short and minded, you know, strategy. Well, I can tell you it's exactly the difference between is our company now so big and so great and has such a reputation that we're now playing to not lose or are we playing to win? And if exactly. we're playing to not lose, this, this which it. means this, this, this. we want to hold it tight, this, this, we can't this. risk anything, then this, we're this, not this. going to take risks on people who think differently or act differently or want to take big risks yeah. or do really creative things, right? There's a, there's an old saying, you never get fired for hiring a big four firm, right? If you get McKinsey to come into your company exactly. and do some side of analysis, you're not going to get fired. So mediocre, but not too risky people, in a in a an environment that's risk averse those are the people that move up in the ranks no i i i absolutely i absolutely agree and the, I, there is another issue in those companies michael 
if the company is getting really bigger and bigger, that company is putting in the in the middle of the organization a lot of smart people with Harvard, Stanford, and so on, but they never seen customer, for example. Yes, so exactly. what they try to do to make them to be more important, they try to send emails up to the bosses, to the big bosses, and they try to manage the field, you know, right? But they have really very low value added, and usually this is the first piece of the organization. If, if there is a crisis, that piece is going to be cut, and it's very bad, right? Because you should you should put those people to the corporation so they can learn on the top, you know, or to the field, you know, right? And then they can be really facilitate that you know discussion and communication in the middle of the organization. Anyway, yeah. so. That will be that's an, for another discussion. Yeah. <laughs> a whole other day. Oh, How to make oh. middle management not be mediocre. It's usually not their fault. I like that as a topic. Absolutely. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was this one was exceptionally on Monday. So, Lisa, when is the next one? We, we do it every second Thursday, Thursday. at 8 o'clock. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so keep, stay tuned. Watch us. Not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. We're back yes, on schedule. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, Follow guys, us thanks. on LinkedIn. Stay in touch. If you have a good topic, thanks, let us know. Much. Yeah. Thanks very much. Stay healthy. Okay. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.